Are you guys kicking it off with an introduction or I'm starting? Yeah, we just went live. Yep. Hey, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, and welcome to the, the final session for the convention. I apologize for the delay. That was on our end. Uh, so sorry about that. But uh, we're really ending the convention off with a bang. We have Winning Mindset uh, with us today. Winning Mindset was developed by former nationally ranked all Ivy League wrestlers, Gene and Jeff Zanetti, to help individuals and teams reach their full potential uh, in sports, school, and life. Uh, we have the co-founder, Gene Zanetti here, graduated with a psychology degree from the University of Pennsylvania. He has two master's degrees, one in sports psychology and the other in clinical psychology. And Gene is a certified uh, school psychologist, personal trainer, and nutritionist. And they've developed this really awesome platform, Z Winning Mindset. So I'll turn it over to Gene for their presentation. Excellent. All right. It's time to get the mental edge. Super excited to be here with everyone. So really, you know, we've been coaching with teams for the past 13 years in sports, sales teams. I mean, really, the great thing is that mindset is the gift that keeps on giving, right? Mindset is mindset, whether you're in a championship sporting competition, taking the SATs or ACTs in a job interview, giving a best man or maid of honor speech, uh, saying no to drugs or peer pressure. We're operating in a post-COVID world of uncertainty and change. It, it comes down to the mind, right? Everyone always says, when you look at sports, they say it's 95% mental. Like the top athletes, the top coaches, they always say it's 90% mental. But then when you look at how much time they're spending training physically versus mentally, it's usually the complete opposite. I mean, even think about your teams that you have, your athletes, it's... It, it really is. We, we spend so much time physical and not enough time mental. And like I said, this works across the board. Not only have we worked with Olympic teams, both men and women, we've also worked with UFC fighters. We work with Lance Berkman and Andy Pettit's baseball team in Houston, Texas. We work with Fortune 500 sales companies. We work with the San Francisco Conservatory of Music and Huntington Learning Center for Academics. So our message applies right through the board. And I could tell you our eight-year-old kids that we're dealing with, they struggle with the same things as a lot of the high-level executives on these high-powered sales teams, as well as our Olympians. So basically our job is to, we've taken some of the most mentally tough people in the world. We make them even tougher because there's always room for improvement. Whenever you think you have all the answers, that means you need to start changing your questions, right? The biggest room in the world is the room for improvement. So we're constantly growing, right? A tree is either growing or it's dying. So is an individual, so is an athletic department. And it has everything to do with asking yourself that fundamental question. Am I content with where I'm at or am I trying to get better? The athletic departments that are look, really looking to maximize the potential of their athletes and coaches can and will eventually beat the athletic departments that are not focusing on maximization of resources. So the best way to maximize is getting that mind right. Do we even know how to do that? Is there a plan in place? Do you have a plan in place for the mental preparation of your coaches and for your athletes? Most people, unfortunately, they don't have a formal plan. There's no concrete way of addressing factors like confidence, focus, relaxing under pressure, staying in the present moment, having clarity, aggressiveness. A lot of times there's certain, there's certain schools where they have that inferiority complex. Maybe they never quite turn that corner and, and, and they're still giving good opponents too much respect. See, we see the same kind of what I like to call mindset red flags or mental mistakes. We see this across the board. So giving other good teams too much respect, competing too cautious, hesitating, being too conservative, doing a lot better in practice than in competition, being a slow starter, not knowing how to manage a lead and not really having a culture. And what we need to create is a culture and a community. And it starts top down. As an athletic director, we worked with many of them over the years. You're sitting at the top. You're the CEO. You're the executive of the whole operation. You already know that. Then there's the coaches and then there's the athletes. And we're also managing a lot of egos with the parents, aren't we? So to create a culture, to really build a dynasty, and really just to have a successful operation, we need to build a well-oiled machine. 
That's why with our mindset program, it's a systematic program and it's real simple. It's basically a plug and chug. It's very easy to incorporate the things we're doing right into your sports teams. It's an easy transition, but it's making sure we address the mindset head on. So there's three big reasons why people do mental training. Number one, to build a culture. Number two, to overcome some very strong mental weaknesses. And three, to maintain a mental edge over the competition. All three of those are important and different people bring us on for different reasons. We were working with over 250 teams, 200, 250 teams before COVID lockdowns. And same thing with individuals. I know a lot of you as athletic directors are also coaches. Well, we work with, we work with individual teams as well as athletic departments. A lot of your, your kids, your actual children, a lot of you are parents, we work with one-on-ones also. So that's just another avenue we go down. But like I said, it really falls into those three categories. Number one, building a culture, having that leadership, developing virtue across the board. Our goal is the same as yours. We want to use sports as a vehicle to build virtue and mental skills for life. We're all about winning. Again, we work with some of the most elite programs and Fortune 500 companies. As far as I'm concerned, if we're not making these coaches and these athletes better people, we lost. Right? We, we missed the biggest lesson in sports. The big lesson in sports is using it to build virtue and to translate these skills and the, this mindset into life. We see it a lot of times. The athletes and the coaches that are able to take those sports lessons and bring them into their career, their marriage, with their children, their social lives, those are the people that gain the most from sports. On the other hand, we sometimes see, it's sad to see this, a lot of great athletes, but they don't translate. They don't, they, they don't translate the lesson from sports to life, to their marriage, to their parenting, to their social relationships. And unfortunately, a lot of their lives are in shambles. Shambles. And you've, and you've seen this, and it's a terrible thing to see. Almost knocked over my water bottle here. But it, it's sad. And I don't take any of this stuff for granted. I have two master's degrees. One's in sports psychology and exercise science. The other one's in clinical psychology. I'm a certified school psychologist. So we've seen the lowest of the lows, people struggling with depression, suicide, substance abuse, anxiety, right? These are low areas. A lot of this stuff can be corrected mentally and emotionally by just addressing the problem. So that leads us to reason number two. Of course, reason number one, building that culture, building that climate, that winning mindset of a culture. Number two is overcoming some serious mental defects. There's a lot of athletic departments and a lot of teams that are struggling because communication between the athletes and the coaches. Well, how do we address that? Are you addressing that head on? If there's dynamics at work within a team, mental, emotional, social, we see it all the time. How are we addressing that? Same thing with, with dynamics between athletes and coaches or coaches and parents or parents and athletes. What we do is we bring everyone together. We're looking to work with the sports family there. So if we're working with, when we're working with your individual sports teams, usually that's how it's broken up. We can do it different ways, but when we're working with the team, we bring in the athletes, the coaches, the parents, and even some up and comers from the middle school age. And that's what that, this way we have the entire sports family there. And, and sometimes someone coming in from the outside, it really goes a long way because if they're hearing it from the coach or from the same people over and over again, there's sometimes that resistance. When we come in from the outside and we're explaining these mindset lessons, the guard is down a lot and we're able to get a lot of things on the record that wouldn't normally be, been spoken of. And again, by doing this 12, 13 years, we've seen it. We know how to have this kind of lasting impact. So overcoming these common mental hurdles, like I said, giving good opponents too much respect. You might see this with some of your kids, some of your kids, your children who are competing, giving good opponents too much respect, being better in practice than in a competition. You know, in something like baseball, you'd see struggling with the yips, see that in golf too, right? Overthinking, having difficulty bouncing back after a mistake, giving good opponents too much respect. We see this all the time, right? Focusing too much on the records, the rankings, the seedings, and the predictions. It's, it's a lot. So we have to address those things head on. The only way you fix a problem is by addressing it head on. Well, we'll say that's the most effective way of handling a problem is to address it head on. 
In other words, if you have a science test tomorrow, you need to study for science. You need to put more of your focus into science than history tomorrow for tomorrow, right? The next day it might switch. You might have to put more of your focus into history because now you have that history test. Same thing. If we're struggling mentally, we need to put our eggs in that basket. We need to invest in working on the mindset. Finally, we work with a lot of people that don't have mental struggles. They're doing very well mentally. In fact, they're some of the best. They're elite level performers. But we all know that the, the, the greater a performer is, the more pressure is on them. The more eyes are watching, the more cameras are there, the more scouts, the more accountable they are to the team. They don't want to let their teammates down. How often do we see that? Athletes not wanting to let their teammates down. So, but a lot of these athletes, they're already at their peak. They're already doing really well, but they, they've built that dynasty and now they want to keep it there. They want to get that edge on their competition. And that's a big reason why a lot of people do mindset training, not just because they're struggling, but because they want to make sure they've crossed their T's, they've dotted their I's, they leave, they leave no stone unturned in bringing out their potential. And that's what's so exciting about mindset, because it really is the gift that keeps on giving. You can and should be applying this to every area of your life. And like I said, to, to have that well-oiled machine that you're looking for, for less complications for yourself, less drama that's going on, and less things that you have to deal with, we're working with them at that micro level. We're addressing the parent-athlete dynamic, the athlete-coach dynamic, the coach-parent dynamic. That's our job, right? So we're, we're excited about that. We're happy to help with all those things. Key thing to remember, when, when we're talking about mindset, this is not motivational speaking. It's not counseling. It's not therapy. Now, I, I love all of those things, right? Obviously, I'm a trained therapist. I follow a lot of great motivational speakers and podcasts and YouTube. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's great stuff. You should be following those things too. Constantly sending out good, positive information to your, to your coaches, to your teams, right? But this is not that, okay? I've done my share of motivational speaking. This is much more like strength training for your mind. Motivational speaking is more like, more like kind of getting a shot in the arm. In other words, it's more like it's, it's the sugar. It's entertainment. What we're after is retention and long-term behavioral change. I have to make certain assumptions. I have to assume that on the school, you're looking to make long-term behavioral change and to retain the information. You know, if you're studying for a test, you could cram for six hours the night before and you could probably get an A the next day. I have a lot of friends in college that did just that. But do they retain the information six months down the road? Ah, that's a different story. If they studied 20 minutes a night, they'd do a better job retaining. It's better to do a little a lot than to do a lot a little. Same thing with exercise. We deal with a lot of people who are looking to lose weight, people who are getting into shape. I was a personal trainer for a number of years. It's better to exercise 20 minutes a day rather than exercise four hours one day a week. It's better to do a little a lot than a lot a little. So when you look at mindset, when you think about what we do, this is strength training for the mind. And this is exactly how the most successful people do it, okay? Making these assumptions again, I have to with a large call. I say, most people here, there's some people on this call who are trying to aim high, who are really trying to make a difference. That means you need to start studying the best in the world, okay? The most successful people, the happiest people in the world, the holiest people in the world, the richest people in the world, the most successful people. You have to start aiming high. If you follow the crowd, if you know how the bell curve works, there's a lot of people in the middle, very few losers and very few winners. We're talking about like ultra, ultra high achiever winners and ultra, ultra low achieving losers, right? Most people end up in the middle, right? So if you follow the crowd, you're likely to end up average. I'm not calling those people losers, by the way. I'm just saying that like in terms of achievement, there's very few people who have almost no success at all. And there's very few people that have almost maximal success. So we have to aim high. If you follow the crowd, you're going to end up average. That means we have to work very hard and very smart. It's not either or. Think about it. A lot of people say work harder, not smarter. And many people use that as an excuse to be lazy, to slack off, to not do enough. This is the opposite of what we're speaking about here. This is the opposite. Okay. We're saying you want to work very hard and very smart. It's both ends. It's not either or. You don't pick one. You pick, you pick both of them. Right. So strength training for the mind. 
How many months out of the year are your serious athletes strength training? 12, well, year round. How about technique? Same question, your most serious athletes. How many months of the year are they practicing their sport? Technically, the X's and O's, the skills and the drills. 12 months, all year round. So if we're applying this analogy to our mindset training, how many months out of the year do you think they should be working on their mindset? Remember in the beginning of the call, we asked, what percentage of your success is physical versus mental? You say 95% of your success is mental. So if we're saying our success is 95% mental, that means 12 months out of the year, we're working on our mindset. We're working with our serious teams and our serious athletic departments all year round, working those mental muscles. Just like we work the muscles in the body, we want to work those muscles in the mind. Next, there's different muscles in the mind, just like there's different muscles in the body. A lot of people look at mindset very unsophisticated, unscientifically. In other words, they'll say, well, this athlete has it and that athlete doesn't have it. This athlete has mindset, that athlete doesn't have mindset. I'm guilty of it too. I was a coach, I was in your shoes before, coaching teams, well, for those of you that were coaches, and I would think, oh, this athlete has the mindset, that athlete doesn't have mindset. You know, the more time that goes by, the more I realize that's just not accurate. That's a, that's a very archaic, unscientific way of looking at it. If you had one athlete that was very good, very good with motivation, They'll come in, they'll come in early, they'll stay late, they'll do everything you ask of them, they'll push hard, okay? But at the same time, they get into a big competition, they choke. They wet the bed in the biggest competitions. They, they underperform very consistently. Is that athlete mentally strong or weak? Now, in my, in my earlier days, I would have said, oh, they're mentally weak because they're not able to snap it on for a performance. Well, no, they're mentally strong with motivation. They're mentally weak with relaxing under pressure, different mental muscles, just like there's different muscles in the body, there's different muscles in the mind. That's the way to look at it. You could have certain athletes that have strong legs, but weak arms. Another athlete has a strong neck, but a weak grip. So different muscles in the body, different muscles in the mind. You might have another athlete that is extremely confident, has great swagger. They can always snap it together mentally for, for a big performance. However, they're getting into problems off the field. They're smoking, they're drinking, they're doing drugs, they're in a bad relationship, they're hanging out with the wrong crowd. Is that athlete mentally strong or weak? I would argue both. I would say with the mental muscle of confidence, they're very strong, and I'd like to develop that even more. But when it comes to goal setting, specifically action planning, living a clean life, they are relatively mentally weak right now, and eventually they're going to meet someone who is equal talent as them and who's equally confident, and they're going to get beat. So it's very important that we understand the way we look at the mind has to be similar to the way we look at the body. There's different mental muscles, and everyone can benefit from mental training. People ask, when do you stop mindset training? When you stop competing in sports, right? When would you stop, when would you stop weightlifting once your career is over? When would you stop doing your technical training when your career is over? It's the same thing with mindset. New struggles present, or present themselves to us all the time. And now more so than ever with the post-COVID world, we know how bad the CDC numbers are. The failure rate in virtual learning jumped to about 40%. I know one in four college-age students seriously considered suicide back in last June, a year, a year ago from the day. It was 25% uh, of college-age students seriously considered suicide. That's a big deal. The failure rate again being up. We know also from scientific journals, the research, that most athletes gained weight and got out of shape and had negative performance and, and had negative you know, detriments to their performance. We've seen this in sports science research. We're constantly looking at this information. We want to see what's going on, looking at the numbers, taking a scientific approach to this evidence-based, and, and it hasn't been good. Of course, there's athletes here and there and teams that have benefited from it, and that's who we want to be. We want to be the ones who benefit, who keep that mental edge and who continue to grow stronger even during adversity. So how much more important is mindset now in a post COVID world where uncertainty is high? We got locked down before, so that means they could do it again at any time and people could get sick. We just don't know. But what we do know is that our mindset has to be ready. Finally, mindset training is similar to strength training in that 
It's not just lip service. As I said, it's not motivational speaking. As a school psychologist, I needed to learn how do people learn and retain information? And we know that if you're just listening to a lecture, let's say today, and let's say you're not taking notes, what's your average retention rate? What do you think? It's 5%, 5% that's down there in the toilet. That's almost like we're not even here. So we need to take notes. We need to do the mindset exercises. If I tell you once, I, I say it 93 times, you have to do the things we're telling to, you to do. We have sports specific systematic mindset programs. In other words, if you're coaching a lacrosse team, our lacrosse team just won the NCAAs uh, last week or two weeks ago, RIT. It's the first NCAA championship in that school's history, Division Three. We, okay, we have a lacrosse specific systematic mindset program. The wrestling team, they have the wrestling specific curriculum. The baseball team is a baseball specific curriculum. The essence is the same in all the different lessons, but the word choice is different. So I could work with a group of 15 different sports and, and those 15 sports have their own language, their own terminology, and that's expressed on their worksheets. So if I'm going over, let's say confidence week three, I know that's, I know that's body language. Body language is going to manifest itself different for a golfer versus a tennis player versus a football player. That's okay. Each one of them needs body language. It's important for all of them to succeed. I wouldn't say it's more important for the football player than the golfer. No way. So the idea is our language on the curriculum is specific to each sport. So that's very important. So it grabs the athlete's attention. It's relatable. They understand. But at the same time, I could teach the lesson to 15 different groups because the essence is the same. It's body language and how that pertains to confidence. That's just one lesson. We have that throughout the year. So our recommendation is always that your teams and your coaches are going through this on a weekly basis or at least twice a month because they need that consistency. You don't want this to look like motivational speaking or, or therapy or counseling. And again, we're always encouraging those things. I encourage your athletes to watch more motivational speakers. I encourage your coaches, your athletes, that if you need help, speak to the school counselor. That's a good thing. That's a strength. That's not a weakness. But what we're doing with mindset training requires consistency. It has to be done. And another thing, we're very big on our social media presence. We're very big on making sure that these athletes and these coaches were staying in their minds on a regular basis. So we know where, where are the kids throughout the week? If they're with us one day a week for, for two hours or for an hour, and they're with you five days a week for two hours or your coaches, they're with, they're with your coaches two day, you know, five days a week, maybe for two hours. What are they doing all the other time? They're on Instagram. They're on social media. They're on YouTube. So we're constantly pumping out great information. This is something that I want you to take advantage of this information. I'm going to post this up on the notes right now. But our, our link tree, which contains our website, our podcast, our YouTube page, that's all there. We have a great book. Also, our daily motivational text message. This is something you're going to want to do. So text mindset one. So mindset, the number one to the number eight, four, five, seven, six. Every day, we just give free information. We have a Mindset Monday, a Toughness Tuesday challenge. We have Wednesday Wisdom, a Thursday Nutrition Tip, a Fitness Friday Tip. We'll give some kind of sale on Saturday to give a little bit of a discount for you. And then on Sunday, we'll have a Sunday Inspirational Story. So we're constantly pumping out great information for free to keep these people engaged your coaches and your athletes. It's just as important for your coaches. Your coaches are all over social media also. So there's always a tendency to fill our minds with either things that are distractions at, distractions at best, garbage at worst. So we want to make sure to improve the culture. They're being surrounded with some positivity. So we're putting that out there on a regular basis. Like I said, things have to be consistent. If we're not consistent, we're going to lose to someone who is. But if we, if we take the time, if we're diligent about building a culture and changing our attitude, it's, it's really going to go a long way. Like I said, year-round curriculum, we work with individuals and we work with teams. Now I'd like to give you an example of one of our great mindset lessons. So one of the underlying themes of our entire mindset program, and this, this gets tremendous buy-in literally from our youngsters right through our professionals, not only our professional athletes, but our professional business people. So every great leader says the same thing. Control the things in your control. Forget about the things that you can't control. 
We all know that. And especially in a post COVID world, we know that's, that's, that's a buzzword. That's like kind of commonplace. Everyone says that focus on the factors in your control, forget about the factors outside of your control. Sure. But how do you get that message to stick? Because you know how it is with kids. It goes in one ear and out the other. I know. So we've come up with a great analogy that I'm real excited about sharing this with you, that you could apply this right away. And this will help your, your teams, your relationships, your family life, and your career. It really works because it's so vivid and it, the imagery will stick with you. If you look at the animal kingdom, there's two types of animals. There's predator and there's prey. And I ask you the question, how can you tell the difference between a predator and a prey just by looking at them? Think about it. What do you think? How can you tell the difference between a predator and a prey? A lot of people think it's their teeth. A lot of them think it's their size, but it's actually their eyes. So, and I took an animal behavior class at the University of Pennsylvania. Didn't do that well at in it, but I took this lesson with me for the rest of my life. The eyes are different on a predator animal versus a prey. If you look at predator animals, like lions and tigers and bears, oh my, where are their eyes located? On the front of their head or on the side? Predator animals have their eyes on the front of their head. Why? Because they're focusing on things they could control. They could focus on what's in front of them. They're trying to eat lunch. So we say, eyes on the front like to hunt. And then when you look at prey animals, it's the opposite. Squirrels, chipmunks, rabbits, deer. Where are their eyes located? On the front of their head or on the side? Ah, it's the opposite. Their eyes are located on the side of their head. Why? Because they're focusing on what's going on around them. They're looking for the predator. They don't want to be lunch. So just like we say eyes on the front like to hunt, we say eyes on the side like to hide. And that becomes our analogy for focusing on the controllables predator mindset and avoiding focusing on the uncontrollables, the prey mindset. Quick disclaimer here that I should have shared in the beginning. This lesson's never to be taken literally. This is a symbol. This is just an analogy. We say the word predator sometimes and different thoughts come up. Forget about it. Put it aside. We're talking about the animal kingdom. It's just a metaphor. So it's important to share that with the athletes, the team, and the parents. But we haven't had problems with this because it just makes a lot of sense and it's such vivid imagery. So you look at it, the predator animals, the lions, the tigers, the bears, their eyes are located on the front of their head, eyes on the front like to hunt. What does that mean? That means you're focused on your preparation, your lifestyle, your effort, your attitude, and your aggressiveness. Those are the five factors in your control. Before competition, it's your preparation and your lifestyle. Sooner or later, the athlete the team, the athletic department that's living a higher lifestyle and doing a better job with preparation, they're going to beat the other athletic departments. They're going to beat the other sports teams that are living at a lower level of preparation and lifestyle. Maybe not this year, maybe not in three years, but five, 10 years down the road, your athletic department is going to succeed. So we really want to go out of our way to stress the importance of lifestyle and preparation. It begins at the top. It begins with you, the CEO, athletic department, athletic director, coaches, coaches. Because remember, we'd all rather see a sermon than hear one any day. Isn't that true for all of us? I'd rather you show me a sermon rather than tell me one. Let's see. Let's see it. If you're telling me, if you're telling me this is the way to live, then I want to see you live that way. And again, it's just a little kick in the pants. We all could use this. I could benefit from it myself. We all just try to live at the best lifestyle that we can. That's all we can do. Everyone's beginning at a different starting point. That's okay. We're all human. But just if your athletes and your coaches see that you're trying to live at a high level and not in a nose in the air, prideful way, but genuinely trying to live at a better level, genuinely being humble, sincere, you're looking to get better, they'll learn from you. They want to see that. So let's all do a better job of that, myself included. Our preparation, our lifestyle, and then the day of a competition. It comes down to effort, attitude, aggressiveness. That's all you can control, your effort, your attitude, your aggressiveness. Everything else is prey mindset. Comparing yourself to other people, not only are you more likely to choke in the biggest competition in your life, you're also more likely to be depressed, suicidal, hooked on drugs, anxious, 
and just all those bad things that go along with it. When we compare ourselves to other people, when we're constantly looking around, what do other people think of me? When, when we need, when we absolutely need praise, recognition, pity, or approval from other people, we're always looking over our shoulder. What are they thinking of me? I'm comparing myself to the next guy. That's, that's, that's a life of misery. And like I said, whether you're concerned with mental health or whether you're concerned with sports performance, there's no difference in this situation. You'll compete better and you'll be a happier person if you have the predator mindset, focusing on things you can control. So when we're focusing too much on records, rankings, seedings, predictions. Now, in your situation, you're, this, is a unique, this is a unique talk right now because I'm speaking a little bit different to athletic directors than I would coaches and athletes. It's important that for our promotional purposes, we do emphasize records, rankings, seedings, predictions, and the storyline. Why? Because it gets people excited. It brings in money from donors. When we, when we build up the storyline, when we build up the, the rankings, the records, oh, we're going against this team and they did this and we beat them last year. The important thing is within internal communications, there's a big difference between internal communications versus external communications. Very important distinction that I speak about with ADs that I don't, that I wouldn't with coaches and athletes to the same extent. The athletes themselves can't care about the records, ranking, seedings, predictions. That will destroy their performance. Coaches got to be real careful with it. Athletic directors a little bit, eh, the coaches too. We do have to be mindful of it a little bit because we want to promote. We want to get the donor's support. We want, we want more money coming into our program. We want to sell more tickets because that's good for the team. That's good for the kids too. So that balance is important. Making it clear to your coaches who will then communicate that to their athletes that what we do externally is not the same as what we're really focused on. In other words, we can't care about that. When you're performing in that same thing, if you're in a performance, you can't be focused on your comparisons to other people. So that's all prey mindset. And the kids, they really do have it hard. They have it harder than we did when we were competing. Why? They have social media out the wazoo way more than we did. So I remember then I would check the newspaper. I would look at the box scores when I was a kid. I, I wanted to see you know, how my opponents did, who I was going up against next week, what the scores were. I wanted to read the storylines. Well, now the kids with Instagram, with TikTok, with Snapchat, it just got infinitely worse because around the playoff time, the championship season, guess what? All that information is flooding into their minds. So they build the performance up. They put the performance on a pedestal. And nine times out of 10, if you make a, if you make a competition special, you're going to do worse. Every, every competition is important, but nothing special. If you make it special, you usually do worse. There is, there is maybe like one in, 30 of, one in 30 athletes that they can make a performance big, special, and they do better. And if that's, if that's you as an athlete, keep doing it. Like do what works, don't not do that. But for every one per person that that helps, there's probably 29 that it hurts. So everything's important, nothing special. That's, but again, with social media, they get flooded with information. That's why a lot of the best athletes, I know when they're in the playoff time, they turn off their social media. They don't get caught up in the storylines, the records, the rankings, the seedings, the predictions, the stats, the statistics. A lot of athletes focusing too much on the statistics, a lot of coaches focusing too much on the statistics. Now I get it. The statistics tell us something, but the statistics don't tell us everything. We can't control the statistics directly. If I'm working with the, my Northwestern Mutual, my sales company just broke into the, the Fortune 100 now this year. Last year, they're 102. I've been working with them over a year. We, we're happy to play a little bit of a role in that. They're now at 90, right? Well, with them, if they're focused too much on their numbers, they're going to do worse. The numbers tell you something. They don't tell you everything. You control the numbers indirectly by focusing on the controllables, your effort, your attitude, your aggressiveness. So our entire culture needs to be built around preparation, lifestyle, effort, attitude, aggressiveness. That's what we're going to reward. That's what we're going to positively reinforce. When a team wins, when a team does well, great, we're happy, congratulations, we're excited, but we're not that excited. We're not that excited. Otherwise, what the kids learn is that's the most important thing. 
if we get them, if we as athletic directors, as coaches, as parents, if we get the most excited over the win, if we get more excited over the win than the virtue, preparation, lifestyle, effort, attitude, aggressiveness, sportsmanship, guess what? The kid learns that the most important thing is to succeed. And I'll do anything I have to do to succeed. I'll compromise myself. I'll sacrifice my faith and morals. I'll cheat. I'll lie as long as I get, because that's what's most important. That's what people really care about. So again, this starts at the top and it's not easy. It's not easy. That's why we need the consistency with you guys, that with your, with your coaches, with your athletes, with your teams, with the parents, because it's not easy. When our society has trained us to think like prey, constantly looking around at other people, comparing for other people, looking for that pat on the back, we're more likely to do worse. And as I said, it's not just a matter of underperforming, but it could, it could mess us up mentally and emotionally for our whole lives. So it's a big deal. It's a big deal, this predator and prey mindset. So I tell the athletes, you wake up in the morning, you wash your face, you brush your teeth, you, you look at yourself in the mirror, locate your eyes, where are your eyes located? Front of your head. That means you're a born predator. We're born predators, now we need to start acting like it. We look at effort, attitude, and aggressiveness. Effort, you have a choice at every moment of your life. Am I, go am I gonna go all out or am I gonna hold back? That's a choice you make. No one can make that choice for you. And only you know if you went all out or held back. Anyone could put on a face and make it a show. Look how hard I'm trying, but are you really trying? That's a choice. Are you going to go all out or are you going to hold back? Attitude, you choose to be positive. Being positive is not just a feeling. It's not wearing a smile on your face and laughing and rainbows and sunshine and butterflies and you know, all good things like that, singing kumbaya, holding hands in a circle, singing. Sure, that's great. That's good for camaraderie. We're all about that. We do our share of that. But real positivity is an act of the will. It's a choice. It's a decision you make on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. Are you going to focus on the positives or the negatives? It's your choice. Are you going to put focus on the positives or the negatives? Are you going to, are you going to be the victim? or the victor, the whiner or the winner, the chump or the champ, right? They say the only difference between champ and chump is you. So which one are you gonna be? It's a choice. The most successful people, they, ma they make a conscious choice to focus on the positives, to focus on the opportunity, to focus on what they're thankful for. One of the things we do with all of our teams before and after every practice, and they'll do this before competition. You could see our national championship lacrosse team. They did this before their games. They go through the four mindset principles. I am thankful for the opportunity to compete. I'm aggressive and relentless. I have no fear of losing or making mistakes. And I never, ever give up. They go through all four of those before and after every competition. I'll go through them all again. Number one, I am thankful for the opportunity to compete. Number two, I am aggressive and relentless. Number three, I have no fear of losing or making mistakes. And number four, I never, ever give up. Just like you get physical reps in the weight room, you get strength reps, but you don't just lift the weight one time, you multiple reps, make the muscle stronger. Just like you have technical reps, you do your skills, your drills, your, you practice your technique, just like you have the reps there, you have mental reps. These mindset principles, we say them out loud as a group, we stand up. And this way, our mouth teaches our brain, our mouth teaches our heart. We build that camaraderie and that culture. And we allow our teams to even add more mindset principles based on what are their, what are the coaches' principles? What do the athletes want to add? But we want them to include at least those four. They say it out loud. They get their mental reps. We've had at least three NCAA champions right after they won. The first thing they said in their interview was one of those mindset principles. Why? Because we had them so well-trained mentally, they knew what they were thinking. They knew exactly what was going on in their head. And when they needed it the most, their mindset helped get them through because they were trained. They got their mental reps. I bring this all up in context because we spoke about attitude, the importance of attitude, focusing on opportunity, focusing on what can I do and focusing on what I'm grateful for. It's an act of the will. It's a choice. It's not a feeling being grateful. 
I want you to weaponize gratitude. I want you to make gratitude your greatest weapon. A lot of teams, athletes, coaches, athletic departments don't know how to do that. If we have a program and teams that have gratitude, it's hard to be nervous in a game or a match. It's hard to be nervous and be thankful at the same time. At the same time, so that's performance-wise. You hear this in athletes all the time. When they achieve something very big, they're in a championship game, I was thankful for the opportunity. There's, it's not surprising why they performed well because they were thankful for the opportunity. Well, on the other hand, mental health, emotional well-being, it's hard to be depressed and anxious and thankful at the same time. So it counteracts, it counteracts a lot of the problems that we struggle with in life. So it's a choice. You choose to focus on the positives, the opportunity, what you're grateful for. And it's not easy to do. When you're having a bad day, when you get a bad call from a referee, when there's tension on the team, after we just lose a competition, as a wrestler, if I, if I still have to suck five or 10 more pounds, it's, it's hard to be positive. So it's a choice. It's a discipline. So disciplining yourselves to be positive. The most successful people will. The average people will be lazy thinkers and keep doing what they're doing. And finally, aggressiveness. That means playing to win, not playing not to lose. And in no way am I saying focus on winning, on winning or losing, because that's prey mindset. If you're focusing too much on winning or losing, that's prey mindset. But, folk, but playing the game to win, competing to win, means being aggressive. John Wooden, who is highly regarded as the greatest coach of the 20th century, said the team that makes the most mistakes usually wins. What does that mean? He didn't like mistakes. He hated mistakes. But the point was he did not want his athletes to be afraid of making mistakes. So we're taking chances. We're going for it. We're being intelligently aggressive. Now, also, quick caveat here, we're not talking about going against the team plan. So there's a strategy within the team that the coach decides, not the athletes. There's a strategy, and that hierarchy is important. It's not athlete and coach on, on, on similar playing fields. It's coach and then athletes. So the authority structure is very important, and kids need to understand that. But within the coaching strategy, the athletes can't be afraid to make mistakes. They need to take chances and go for it. So like I said, this, this predator mindset, focusing on the controllables has lasting implications, not just for performance success, but also for their entire lives. So we want to make sure we take the bull by the horns with that. Like I said, it's, we're pu putting out a lot of information. I put it up there on the side, our daily motivation text. You send that out to your teams, send that out to your coaches. You should be getting it every day. We have a book there and we also have our link tree. Now within that, each sport has a built out Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter page. So if you coach football, look up football mindset, and that'll give you all the football specific information, right? Again, the three big reasons why people are doing mindset training, as we said, it's, it's 95% mental, your success in any area of life, whether it's weight loss, whether it's you know, parenting, whether it's sports, whether it's your career, it's 95% mental. And we know there's a big gap between our preparation and our training in the physical and the mental. We put a lot more time in on our physical training than our mental. So we, we need to bridge that gap. Three big reasons. We're looking to build that culture. We want a solid atmosphere and environment around the kids, a lasting dynasty across the sports. Two, we're struggling with some of those main Mindset red flags, like I said, giving good opponents too much respect, having difficulty bouncing back from mistakes, being better in practice than in competition, uh, focusing too much on factors outside of our control, being a slow starter, having the yips, all of those things. And finally, just keeping that mental edge, building the gap between us and our opponents. Mental edge, something that we have that, again, these messages apply to the rest of their life. So Anyone who's on this call, I'm more than happy to do a free introductory session for any of your teams. I'd love to do this on a more regular basis, of course. The real gold comes in doing the worksheets consistently. Our program consists of, we give the mindset worksheets. We take your athletes through them right in front of us, just like a strength trainer takes a team through a lift, and that's how they improve. So at the end of your career, you want to make sure you left no stone unturned. You did everything you possibly could to achieve your goals. Even the best athletes and the best teams, like I said, sometimes they need the most mindset training because they have the most to lose. They have the most riding on all the expectations and all the eyes are on them. So we want to make sure that we left nothing chance. We did everything to control our goals. And most importantly, 
We used sports as a vehicle to build virtue. So we're better people now in our lives, not just sports, but also our personal relationships and our future careers. As I always say, whether it's sports, school, business, or life, mindset makes the difference. I thank you very much. And I open it up for the next 13 minutes to answer any questions. Thanks so much. Uh, outstanding presentation. And uh, as we've done in the past, uh, our attendees can either raise their hand and speak directly or uh, put something into the Q&A. And we I will wait just a couple of minutes. All right. I knew we threw a lot of content out there, but it's a lot of important things, and a lot of these things don't tend to get addressed right away. So if we address them head on, it, it really goes a long way. And like I said, it, this is the type of thing that really applies across the board to anything. Like I said, doesn't matter the age group. We work with just as many colleges as we do high school teams, probably, or, or very similar, proportionate, we'll say. And like I said, for all areas of life, a lot of we have the individual program as well as the team program. So I'm, I'm sure there are. Oh, I got to see hand raised here. Go ahead, Hillary. Hi, thank you. I, I actually have two questions, if that's okay. Yes. First one is, uh, well, so if you have a coach who's working with a team, do you recommend like having practice time, like just like you would on the basketball court or the soccer field, like built into the regular practice day to work on this? I assume you would, but, or do you, do you like have a different practice just for mindset stuff? Uh, that would depend on what the coach wants to do. We do it both ways. So it really works with, you know, every team is a little bit different and especially after COVID, the structure is a little bit different. So we could do whatever works best for you guys. Okay. And then it also seems like you could pretty easily apply this to a non-sport environment, like an office environment or um, workspace team. Oh, yeah. uh, accurate to say? Absolutely. Absolutely. We work with non-sports all the time. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. We're waiting to see if any others come in. Yeah, you know, I really just appreciate how applicable uh, all of the content is to everyday life, relationships like you said, the personal relationships, romantic relationships. Oh, and parenting. I mean, how, it's so easy to compare kids. And when you do that and the kids get that in their head, it's just devastating to their performance and also just how they feel about themselves. It's like we want to focus on each person as an individual. Of course, so like our program is it's systematic, but at the same time, each kid is going to be different and each person is going to be a little bit different. So they need a little something different there. And, and it goes with us too. I mean, how many times we catch ourselves comparing to other people or focusing on factors outside of our control. So that predator prey mindset really does serve as a good mental, a visual cue to reel us back in when we start going off the rails. And really it's that simple. The controllables are your preparation, your lifestyle, your effort, attitude, and aggressiveness. And then there's millions of ways to think like a prey. <laughs> All right, we're not seeing any other uh, questions, comments come in. We'll give just a few more seconds. And meanwhile, I'll, I'll tell everybody that, uh, you know, with the permission of Gene, we do plan on uh, sharing this presentation. And uh, we'll also send, up, uh, send out a follow-up email with Z-Winning Mindset contact information for any programs who would like to utilize it. With that, Gene, thanks so much. Uh, it was a pleasure meeting you. Great content. And uh, we look forward to having you back at another USCA event in the future. Absolutely. Very happy to help. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Take care. Take care.